supposed to represent a consensus. Think how difficult it is to get a law passed. You need the identical law to pass both houses of Congress and the approval of the president. Now, the Constitution doesn't use the word veto. You can picture what they saw. Well, Congress will pass a law, they'll send it on to George Washington, and if he agrees with it, he'll sign. If not, he'll say, guys, here are my reasons for disagreeing. They will give it respectful consideration, and uh, it would take two-thirds vote to override it. It's very difficult to override. I think there was one override in the Clinton administration, one override uh, in, in the Bush administration. What was happening, of course, uh, ever since 2006, when the Democrats gained control of Congress, is Congress would pass laws, the president would veto, would veto them, and they couldn't pass it over the president's veto. Uh, now, let me just say something about political parties. Uh, they've been with us ever since. We have a true two-party system uh, with the parties alternating power. Why can a third party never get any traction? They can nominate a candidate like Ross Perot in 1992 and 96, but they don't have any staying power after the election. The two parties have party organizations in every state. They run candidates for most every office. And as I say, what's interesting is they alternate power. Uh, there have been 28 presidential elections since 1900. Counting the election of 2008, the Republicans have won 15, and the Democrats have won 13. I understand from those who uh, study the popular vote that that's pretty evenly divided. <coughs> Let me make another comment about our system. It is totally inaccurate to talk about the popular vote, because it doesn't count. Uh, the, the Canadians are better on that. If you watch uh, on CBC, the parliamentary elections. They report the results in ridings because what matters is who wins the riding. Uh, in our, for the presidential election, it matters who wins the states. Again, the <coughs> framers weren't going to trust, quote, the people with the important task of electing a president. Remember, the people meant white male property owners, but that could include small farmers and artists, and uh, the framers just didn't, didn't trust them. But they had to have a commitment to electoral democracy. So they said, okay, uh, people, you elect wise men from each state. They're going to get together in the state capitol, and they're going to decide how the electoral, how the votes are going to go. Uh, every state has at least uh, three votes equal to uh, the senators and representatives. The Constitution gives each state one representative. So a state like Alaska has two senators and one representative. Uh, uh, anyhow, uh, the popular vote is meaningless, uh, as, as it would not be if we had direct election of a president. If you are a Republican in California, it's pretty unlikely that your vote is going to mean anything because a Democrat is going to carry the state. The same thing as if you're a Democrat in Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas. So what we call the popular vote is simply the sum total of the votes for electors in, in all of the states. So claim, well, well, Al Gore won the popular vote in, uh, in 2000. We don't know what the popular vote would have been if we elected the president directly the way they do in France and, uh, and other countries. And by the way, nothing's going to change. Uh, the framers were incredible egotists. Uh, they believed that they had the perfect system of government. So in order to get an amendment, you need, as you know, two-thirds of both houses and three-quarters of the states. Counting the Bill of Rights, uh, the first ten amendments, as part of the original Constitution, because it was enacted almost contemporaneously with it, We've only had 17 amendments since. Uh, uh, very, very difficult. Um, so uh, the fact that the Democrats won big, if you will, 
in 2008 that President Obama was elected by 10 million popular votes, as opposed to President Bush elected by 3 million in 2005, and the Democrats have both houses of Congress, doesn't mean anything. Uh, that, that's, that's an overstatement. <coughs> Uh, it doesn't mean as much as it might in a system of party, dis party discipline, such as they have uh, in, uh, in England, where you, if you're a conservative, you vote one way, you're Labour, you vote. Each senator and representative is there to represent the interests of his or her state or district. Uh, there is no such thing as a national interest I mean, in constitutional theory. What is the national interest is the sum total of 435 congressional districts and uh, 50 states. When the big three thought that their profits were in large gas-guzzling vehicles, all of Michigan's senators and representatives opposed any improvement in the CAPE standards. Strong as their own feelings about the environment may have been, uh, it was more important to advance the economic interests of Michigan. Now that the big three are switching to small cars and needed a bailout, all of Michigan's senators and representatives, without regard to party, were supportive of the bailout. Whereas Richard Selby, Shelby in Alabama, where they have a BMW and a Mercedes plant, if I'm right, was very much opposed to to the bill, because again, he was trying to advance uh, the interests of uh, the owns of his own state. Take uh, Chuck Schumer, who is the chair of the Senate Banking Committee. He is a quote liberal Democrat, but he is always aware of the interests of Wall Street and the interests of the banking uh, industry. It would be very inter uh, very interesting to see. Uh, what happens with Obama's programs to tax the 50 biggest banks and to uh, <coughs> change the regulation to break up some banks. Now, I think that the, quote, popular demand may be such that it can't be resisted, but watch for Schumer and Gillibrand and people from New York trying to protect the banks uh, as much as, uh, uh, as they can. Uh, the uh, uh, Sam Rayburn, the longtime speaker of the House, got to be pretty old to remember Sam Rayburn, but I, I am, and I saw at the Democratic Convention in '56. I was between law school and college and law school, and I was there. Uh, and Rayburn said, Rayburn said quite correctly, if you have to make the choice between voting your party and voting your district, you have to vote your district. And this is what is going on in Congress right now. One of the difficulties for the Democrats is that they gain so many seats in what we would call red states. So if you're a Democratic member of Congress from uh, Alabama uh, or Mississippi, you have to pay some attention to values, if you will, and interests in, uh, in that. There was one House <coughs> member who voted for uh, the uh, health care reform. He was elected from Louisiana uh, to replace, uh, I forget the name of the guy who, uh, Jefferson. Jefferson. And uh, this is, he's a Republican in an overwhelming Democratic district. Now, keep your eye on Scott Brown. <coughs> uh, yes, Scott Brown is a Republican, uh, but he is from Massachusetts. He has to come up for election in two and a half years. He ran the tide of opposition to health care reform in Massachusetts, which interestingly enough, as long has its own health care reform initiated by Mitt Romney when he was governor of California. And by any definition, Romney was a moderate on economic and social issues. When Romney ran for president, he said, oh, the Massachusetts plan is okay for Massachusetts, but nowhere else, because that would be socialized medicine or, uh, or something uh, to that effect. Uh, the uh, president then... Uh